thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to try to introduce extracellular vesicles on this educational day. And as you can see from uh, my title, um, the, the focus will be to give a general introduction to EVs, uh, why we think they're interested, interesting, how they can be used in diagnostics, but also as therapeutic tools. Um, but the main emphasis will be on how do we best prepare these for downstream applications. And before going to showing the slides, I have a disclaimer, and that's that I'm a co-founder, shareholder, and consultant for Evox Therapeutics, which is a company that develops engineered EVs for treatment of disease. So what are EVs? Um, there are different types of vesicles, so it's a, like a combined name for all vesicles that are secreted to the extracellular space. They are roughly between 40 and 150 nanometers um, in size, um, and they carry various macromolecules such as protein receptors, RNAs, microRNAs, mRNAs, other non-coding RNAs, luminal proteins, ligands, and uh, MHC class molecules for antigen presentation. Um, when we speak about EVs, we talk, typically talk about two types of vesicles. Uh, the ones that bud from the membrane, which are usually referred to as microvesicles, uh, and the ones that are secreted through the uh, MVB pathway, which are commonly called exosomes. Uh, the distinction a few years ago was quite clear, but we now know that there is a great overlap between these two vesicle types, and therefore we jointly named them EVs. And the way they can act in, in recipient cells is, for example, to present antigens, induce cell, cell signaling on the surface, there are some cases of membrane fusion to transfer a genetic cargo, such an RNA or, or a, a microRNA, uh, and also the transfer of receptors and ligand receptor interactions. So they have multiple uh, functions when uh, getting in contact with the recipient cell. What is really unique is their ability to convey macromolecules uh, from distant places. So I've covered some of these, but just to give you an overview on the biological functions of, of EVs, as I said, in normal physiology, they, are, they take part in, in uh, induced immune responses towards pathogens, for example. Uh, they are involved in the spread of morphogens for gradient distributions. Uh, of course, as they play a role in biology, they also have uh, a role in the spread of pathology, and this is just two examples that tumors uh, Cancer, cancer-derived EVs can induce um, uh, T cell death uh, to uh, alter the immune system, uh, and there has been several pathogenic proteins such as alpha synuclein and AP, uh, A beta that has been proposed to be transported within the brain through the help of these vesicles. Of course, the fact that they are involved in some of the pathology of disease also makes them uh, really interesting liquid biomarkers of disease. Uh, and some examples, most of this work is within the cancer field, uh, and Exodiagnostics was one of the first companies, and I think that has made the greatest success in, in actually staging tumors uh, and by looking at, at various uh, proteins uh, that are carried within these vesicles. And my main interest in my lab, we are more interested in using these EVs, exploit the biology of the EVs and further engineer them for drug delivery. This is just a quick slide to show what, how do we typically characterize. So exosomes, for example, they have common features. So usually when you probe a sample, when you if you have your vesicles there, uh, you will see common proteins such as tetraspanins, ALX, TSG 101, certain small RNAs and lipid rafts. But there are also, of course, depending on the so uh, source cell, there will be specific components encapsulated and, and presented on these vesicles. So in dendritic cells, you will have MHC class two molecules with peptides bound to it, and then, for example, in cancer cells, we can find VEGF and other, other growth factors that are uh, stimulating cancer growth. So I think this is a, it's a collaborative work that we published last year with, with guys at Novartis and, and Nicole Meissner's lab, and really why I think EVs are interesting biological nanoparticles for, for drug delivery. And what we show in this paper is basically that at very, very low concentrations, 
you have an extremely rapid uptake into recipient cells of EVs. So these EVs, they are genetically manipulated to carry GFP and RFP at the same time so that we can trace them in recipient cells. And this kinetics uh, is saturated at, uh, very quickly, this uptake. And what is interesting, very similar to viruses, uh, they seem to enter cells as single vesicles. So in contrast to most synthetic drug delivery systems, which usually cluster on the surface of the cell, prior to endocytosis, these enter via endocytosis as single vesicles. And this might also explain this mechanism or mode of action, and especially the fact that we see a lot of the vesicles uh, sc uh, um, uh, scanning rough ER, could explain some of these very interesting publications that has come since back in 2007. Uh, the pioneering paper from Jan Lötval and also the paper from Johan Skogen and uh, Sandra Brakefield that microRNAs and mRNAs can be functionally transferred uh, from one cell to another through EVs. Uh, and actually, since this initial paper, I did this a month ago, I think there has been now been 1,200 publications showing uh, microRNA delivery or microRNA transfer uh, since 2008. This is a very recent paper that I have put here because I think it's very interesting. It's in vivo showing that uh, adipose-derived circulating microRNAs can regulate gene expression in other tissues. So that really is not something that happens if you just inject, but it also happens in, in real life. And this is another uh, very good paper from uh, Jaco's lab on, on, uh, on the uh, functional transfer of, of a Cree mRNA uh, in vivo in mice. So I think I will stop there when it comes to the RNA because I believe Joshua will speak a little bit more about how we can use this for therapy, for therapeutic delivery of RNA. Um, the other aspect, of course, in addition to delivery, as I said, they are interesting because they, are, they take part in, in disease. And I think a lot of the work from David Leiden's lab have shown that EVs actually uh, promote tumor growth by establishing a pre-metastatic niche. And this is his most recent paper where he showed that the integrin combinations on EVs determines organotropic um, metastases of tumors. And of course, uh, similarly, Raghu Kaluri's lab has, has given the fact that these EVs contain signatures from the tumors, they could be used as a diagnostic tool, and they identified glypican-1 in pancreatic cancer cells as a good marker for tumor progression in pancreatic cancer. So, switching gears to how can we use these as a therapy. So, the three areas, the main areas where EVs have been used and where I think a lot of work is going on is in either for antigen presentation, so a lot of the early work in the EV field uh, aimed to, to basically uh, pulse uh, antigen presenting cells with tumor antigens, harvest the EVs and use it as a cell-free product to raise a, an anti-tumor response from the immune system. What has grown more, I would say, over the last couple of years is to, to use EVs for immunomodulation. So by using uh, EVs from mesenchymal stem cell or other stromal cells or stem cell types that we know have an in, in inherent immunomodulatory capacity, you could use that to, to suppress inflammation. And consequently, it has also been successfully used to induce tissue repair and tissue regeneration. So the way I see, or I think many others as well, with EVs is it's kind of a sweet spot, I would say, EV therapeutics, because it's something in between a classical biologic, an RNA or protein therapy, a cell-based therapy, but it lacks a nucleus, so you don't have the issues of, 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 of integrations and other things that you would have with a cell-based therapy, and a drug delivery modality. And this is where we try to, to, to work in, in, the, in this area. So <clears throat> I said that it can mimic cell therapy. This is just one example. This is uh, it's just taken from a review that was published two years ago from Nina Heldring. What th the reported effects of MSC, mesenchymal stem cell-derived exosomes, have, uh, uh, what they can do in, in the body and in recipient cells. And as you can see, they contain a lot of these um, proteins and RNAs that I described before. And what they can lead to is to energy production to support cell survival in recipient cells by providing uh, various, I mean, direct energy, uh, but also uh, <coughs> pro, um, components that, that provide energy, uh, induce energy production in, in recipient cells. Uh, 
Uh, they can deliver proteins and RNA. There are many papers showing that they can promote angiogenesis and suppress apoptosis in uh, damaged tissues. They can deliver tolerogenic factors to lymphocytes and suppress immune responses, and it can also stimulate the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-10. So they, in, a, in their own right, do have therapeutic potential, very similar to the cells that they are derived from. And these are just three papers that I, that I put here on, on the various effects that has been reported in the literature using mesenchymal stromal cell-derived exosomes. This is one example. It's a, a relatively new paper from Dirk Herrmann, Herrmann together with Bernd Giebel, where they uh, show that these EVs can uh, improve post-stroke neurogeneration uh, when, when administered, and with a similar potency as the cell, stem cells as, uh, alone. This is another very good paper published uh, last year uh, in PNAS, where they show that uh, chromatograph chromatographically isolated uh, MSC exosomes can rescue cognitive impairment after traumatic, trauma, trauma, traumatic brain injury. Uh, and this last one is the first and, to my knowledge, only uh, paper actually showing potency of MSC-derived exosomes in man in patients suffering from graft-versus-host disease. So just switching a little bit, so how we want to use this is, of course, to use such a cell source, an MSC cell source that has this uh, immunomodulatory activity, but then further engineer them with a therapeutic entity. That therapeutic entity could either be a soluble protein or an RNA that we have loaded into the EVs, or it could be a receptor or a biologic expressed on the surface of an exosome. And we can combine this by including, for example, targeting moieties. And the way we can direct these proteins, of course, is by having good shuttling proteins. So we've done extensive proteomics to find proteins that can either present a therapeutic protein on the surface or drag it into the EVs luminally. And this is just a workflow for the production. I will come back to the details uh, later. But so what we do is we engineer the producer cells, typically make them stable to express the therapeutic protein of interest. Uh, we grow our cells in, in bioreactors um, where we can harvest two to three liters of media every day. We isolate the EVs, uh, usually by tangential flow filtration followed by size exclusion chromatography, but I will come back to that as well. And then we have our EVs for characterization and testing in different models. And then, of course, the, the different characterization tools, such as nanotracking analysis to determine the number and size of the EVs, uh, uh, electron microscopy to see that we actually have EVs, uh, Western blotting. We do a, quite a lot of multiplexing flow cytometry nowadays to look at uh, uh, multiple markers simultaneously in an EV prep. And this is just one slide, unpublished data, showing that we actually can get potency of these EVs by engineering them. So in this case, we have treated mice with a exos or an EV displaying a therapeutic protein that can se uh, sequester IL-6 ST, an IL-6 receptor IL-6 complex. And when given that systemically in an LPS-induced inflammation model, we see that these mice uh, all survive. Uh, similarly, if we treat with an anti-TNF uh, decoy, that we call them, we also see an increased survival over the mock-treated mice. If we now look at the right-hand side, this is in another inflammatory model, in this case inflammatory colitis, uh, TMBS-induced colitis. We see that when we do treat with our anti-TNF decoys, these mice recover actually to a slightly greater extent than the Remicade-treated mice, whereas the others fall off. So this just shows that you can engineer the surface of the EVs and that uh, to further improve the therapeutic activity of the vesicles. And finally, I just want to show this slide because this is where I come from. When I joined Matthew Wood's lab back in 2011, he had published this paper that sRNAs could be systemically delivered to the brain by putting targeting peptides on the surface of EVs. So this is something that we're working quite a lot on, trying to engineer the surface with different targeting constructs, either antibodies or peptides. And while doing that, we can actually increase uh, the CNS delivery, although there is still space for optimization. So now I'm switching to the purification. So now I've just given you a few examples of, of what EVs can do, why are they useful. Uh, but there are also a lot of pitfalls in this field, and I think it's important to raise some of those pitfalls. And, and actually a lot of that comes down to purification. There are so many reports in the literature showing different data when doing a very similar study, and when you look through the papers, 
turns out that what people have done differently is the purification. And purification has a massive impact on what you're analyzing in your sample and on the biology of the sample that you're purifying. So I will just, <laughs> I just raise some points here. Purity, scalability, these are important aspects, of course. That will affect biology and it will affect functionality. I just put this paper from Peter Vader, a very recent paper, showing actually that depending on how you purify your EVs, you have different uh, abilities to uh, induce a biological response. So <laughs> these are the different tools for characterization that we usually do. Uh, once we have our EVs, we do NTA, as I said, molecular biology methods. We're characterized by electron microscopy. We run regular uh, microscopy, and I will come back to why, on the EVs. We do single vesicle analysis with image flow cytometry, which is now possible. And we do, the, as I said before, the flow cytometry-based phenotyping in these multiplex beads, as well as high-resolution isoelectric focusing LCMSMS to characterize the EVs that we have. <clears throat> Going then into the isolation methods. Um, the vast majority of studies to date, and I think already, I mean, uh, and with the people working with EVs here is differential ultracentrifugation. That's the standard method. Now the market has also seen an expansion of different size exclusion based purification methods as well as precipitation methods. I, I'm not going to discuss anything about the precipitation methods because in my opinion this is not the purification method. It's precipitation. So you're enriching but you're not purifying. So the two things I would like to discuss today is size exclusion versus ultracentrifugation and why, why we think that size exclusion is the way forward if, if, if you want to have consistent results. So ultracentrifugation, the standard protocol from Terry, I think published already back in 2006. You have a low speed spin to remove cells, you have a medium spin to remove larger cell debris. Uh, <clears throat> we usually do an 0.22 micron filtration, this could be a 10,000 G spin. And then you subject it for very high 110,000 G spin twice because you need to w wash in between, otherwise you're going to have a lot of protein and RNA contamination. So it's a quite, quite, quite some steps uh, to get to the final product, which is the EVs then. <clears throat> so when I started my lab five years ago, so I've only been in this field actually for five years, uh, I realized that doing 50 animal experiments, so we usually, when we do our inflammation studies, we have at least 50 mice in each, experiment, uh, each, each time. And if you do this twice a month, you simply can't purify by ultracentrifugation because at least that in our hands it's not scalable enough. So we looked into other options, such as ultrafiltration. So this is just outlining. It's the same uh, preceding steps, but after the 0.2 micron step, we do a filtration step, either ten tangential flow filtration or spin filtration or ultracentrifugation. And then we quantified how many vesicles do we get. And interestingly, when doing filtration, we saw that we got much higher recoveries than doing ultracentrifugation. And when we probed for the exosomal markers, they were much stronger in the filtrated samples. However, of course, with a filtration, if using a 100 kD cutoff, you're going to get a lot of albumin contamination. So that's the downside. You get high recovery, like with precipitation, but you have contamination. You need to get rid of that. And that's why we introduced a, 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 an LC or a size exclusion step in the, with li liquid chromatography. And what we saw then is we get the first nice protein peak, which we call fraction one. This could be multiple fractions depending on what media we're using. And then you get a massive second peak. And we probe for the exosomal markers. It turns out that all the exosomal markers ends up in the first peak, whereas the other fractions are empty. And Good, good for us, we also remove all the contaminating protein. It's empty in fraction one, but it all comes in fraction two. So if we wouldn't have had done that step, we would have had all these proteins and RNAs in our sample in the end, not looking at EVs then. When we do proteomics on this, we see that it's very similar uh, in terms of if we have a very pure UC prep or a very pure LC prep, it's very similar, the proteome of the EVs that we look at. <coughs> The issue with UC that we have noticed, we've done a lot of biodistribution studies trying to understand where do EVs go, where does EVs from different cell sources uh, travel in vivo. And while doing that, actually by only simple light microscopy, we typically see these very nice uh, bright dots. These are GFP positive exosomes. And this on, we only see that in the UC samples, never in the filtrated and, and chromatography purified samples. And this is what we think because you have aggregation, irreversible aggregation due to the high G forces that you use through the UC spin. And this is also evident from turf imaging. 
and this actually do affect reproducibly by distribution of these vesicles in mice because we consistently see a greater accumulation of these vesicles in lungs of mice injected if using ultracentrifugated uh, uh, samples. So <clears throat> we, we think, and, and then the, third, the, the last point where we struggled with the ultracentrifugation is we do a lot of, or we did a lot of uh, embryonic stem cell and induced pluripotent stem cell derived exosome work. And while doing that, you use very complex media. Yes, they are, um, they are serum free, but they are certainly not protein free. They are actually much more protein rich than a 10% serum that you would use. And what happens if you do a UC on any of a mouse, there's media that we use for mouse cells or human cells, and we just run a ponzo. You see these massive bands. This is proteins that are pelleted just by the fact that you do an ultracentrifugation. And you get extensive amounts of particles just from the media. So if you then have the conditioning of your media, how will you distinguish? If you instead use the LC method, what you will see is that you, if probing for the, pro, the total number of particles, they elute in the first fraction and then they go down. You have the particles as I showed because you have it from the media. And then the protein quant goes in the second fraction. So when we then look at the total protein staining, we see that we have a fairly clean first fraction, which also contains all our EV markers. And we are losing out on these contaminating components from the media. So that's another important consideration if you want to do characterization of, of EVs from cells that need to be grown in these specialized medias. You also need to consider how to, to purify it. So the conclusion is just that that we can purify vesicles with improved purity, uh, by physical integrity and yields compared to the ultracentrifugation, and of course this method is scalable. How much do I have left? Um, perfect. Good, then I have some time. So, uh, <coughs> I would like to spend a few minutes then on what we've learned about the secretome of cells by actually switching the method of purification, and I think that can have uh, could be interesting for people, especially people working with microRNA analysis or microRNA transfer experiments. So, <laughs> this is a quite busy slide, but I, I will just highlight. So, in this case, what we do, we use either a size exclusion purification, as I described, or we have now switched to something called bind elute size exclusion. So, instead of just, in just separating by size, we also separate based on charge. So. Smaller proteins will go into the beads and get captured and EVs will elute and we get two fractions. And while doing this, so if we, we first do a, a, a filtration step, tangential flow filtration, uh, and I just want to show you the protein elution profile from such chromatography experiment. You see that you get a very a strong protein peak when you have the purified samples and then it's nothing else. Whereas if you only do the filtration, so not having the cleanup step with the, the, the column, you see that you have a lot of protein. And that's what I showed you before on the, on the Ponzo stainings. What is interesting, though, is rather looking at the RNA elution profile. Since we are all interested, in, or many people are interested in extracellular RNA, it would be good to know where actually are these extracellular RNAs. And when you purify by filtration, you see that you get this massive RNA peak. But when you then do the size exclusion step to real isolate the EVs, you are losing out on a lot of the RNA. And that's because a lot, uh, the vast majority of the small RNAs at least, uh, in those, these preps are not inside EVs. To further prove that, this is uh, unpublished work from Peter Vader's lab. We have done a lot of overexpression experiments with, with microRNA, uh, microRNAs to try to load EVs and, <clears throat> and then done size exclusion. And what we see here is the common elution profile, fraction one, where we get our exosomes and then the contaminating fractions. We see that we get all our particles in the first fraction, which is where we have the exosomes. We also get the exosomal marker in the first fraction, not in the other fractions. And the particle size is pretty much like what you expect from an exosome prep. Interestingly, if looking now then for this overexpressed microRNA in fraction one, the level is exceptionally low. It's higher in fraction two, it's higher in fraction three. In the flow through, meaning the one that, that, that we don't harvest because we do a 100 kD initial filtration. There is massive copy numbers of this given microRNA, which people will miss out on because that would never be purified because you wouldn't look at it. So actually in this case, we counted that we have one in 8,000 is in EVs. Very similar, looking at endogenous, let's 7B in this case, 
doing the same fractionation but not saving the, the, the 100 kD uh, flow through, you see that the microRNA let 7 be very low in fraction 1, very high in the other protein bound fractions when you do the size exclusion separation. Of course, mRNAs, though, they are always exclusively find, found in the vesicles. I don't think there is a secretory mechanism for mRNAs, but for the small microRNAs, there must be a parallel mechanism of secretion. When we do small RNA sequencing, which we've done for now, I think, 20, 20 different cell sources, this is, very, this is just for hex cells, but this looks very similar across all cell types, except for MSCs that have slightly more microRNAs. So if we look at the small RNA portion that you actually isolate, with this LC method, what you will find is that most of these RNAs are R uh, ribosomal RNA fragments, and very, very little of them are microRNAs. In MSCs, as I said, we are probably up at 5% here, but otherwise it looks very similar. And I think others have reported this as well. Uh, if we look at the rest of the secretome, it's predominantly tRNA fragments. So if we would pool the other fractions from the LC, it would be mostly tRNA, but I didn't include that here. <clears throat> but this is interesting because if we then, then we did high, again, high reef uh, LCMS on our exosome preps, trying to correlate the protein content to, to, to the non-coding RNAs that we find. And very interesting is that RNA binding proteins in general in those proteomics runs are overrepresented. But the microRNA binding proteins are massively underrepresented. We do not pick up AGO2 in clean preps. We do not see GV182 in clean preps of EVs. So what you do find, though, is ribosomal RNA binding proteins and mRNA binding proteins. They are very high. And that links pretty well with what we see with the sequencing data. So this is just to give you an example then how could we enrich for a given microRNA. So I will just not spend too much time here. But as I said, AGO2 is basically absent in EVs, in most EVs that we have looked at, except the subclone that... Uh, was described in the Mello paper, uh, MDA, the MDA cells, there is some AGO2. Uh, and we have the exosomal markers. If we then overexpress AGO2, we do get some into the EVs, but it's not much. But if we put a, a, a tag which will direct AGO2 to the exosomes, we start seeing more of AGO2 inside exosomes. And if we at the same time co-express with a microRNA mimic or an shRNA, we see massive enrichment of that given shRNA or microRNA into the EVs. So our conclusion is mere overexpression of microRNAs, at least in our hands, is not really sufficient to drive enough numbers into the EVs. But if you do that in combination with an engineering approach, you may, may, may reach sufficient levels. So as a, just as a summary then, since I have two and a half minutes left, uh, so this is the workflow that I would propose or the workflow that we are using at least for the EV work in, in, in our lab. And we, this, we are either growing cells in 2D cultures, but mostly now changing to bioreactors because holofiber systems, you can have a lot of cells. Uh, the media is pretty clean uh, and, and it allows you to generate enough EVs if you want to do therapeutic uh, experiments. We concentrate it, again, using a holofiber system, but in this case, it's a, a tangential flow filtration device on a holofiber. Uh, and once we've done that, we concentrate our exosome sample, which will then naturally have some impurities because we've just concentrated it, similar to doing a precipitation. Once we have the concentrated EV sample, we either optionally load, which I think Joshua will discuss, you know, the that you can load an exogenous drug to the EVs, although my lab is more focused on genetically, in the first instance, manipulate the cells. Uh, we separate the EVs by a size exclusion system, uh, an ECTA, and we, depending on column type, you can do different things. So what I didn't show here, for example, is that if you have very well separating columns on the, your LC, you can actually also uh, isolate subpopulations of EVs. And then we collect the pure EVs based on the illusion pro uh, 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 chromatogram, and then we do our treatments. And of course, if you have this optional loading step, you need another cleanup step with LC before you inject. Uh, so that's it. Uh, and uh, the people that I would like to acknowledge, of course, is my colleague and uh, 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 former boss in Oxford, Matthew Wood, and his team. My group at Karolinska, Joel Nordin, Oskar Wiklander, Helena, Sork, Julia Corso, Dano Gupta, who's sitting there, Tavi, Andre, Ulrike, Emanuela, Dara, Becklem, Suming, Iman, my collaborators at ASTAR, my former postdoc, Fiona Lee, uh, 
and of course uh, the guys at Novartis, which we're doing a lot of the, the uptake imaging work with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir. We have time for a few questions. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for sharing the, the data and the, your uh, the thoughts. Uh, for uh, deliver a protein, particularly for the in vivo imaging, I guess you did not have time to go through the detail. Uh, one challenge is uh, exome may not be able to synthesize the new protein, and therefore how long uh, exome will be able to circulate in the, the body. You know, do you have any evidence that in terms of the half-life of the exome in vivo as compared, yeah. for example, to the, the protein? Yeah, so uh, yeah, we actually don't have the PKs. We have an idea. It, the half-life of an exosome is much shorter than a protein biologic. So an antibody therapeutic will circulate, you know, days and days and days. This will not happen with EVs. What we do know is that we can formulate, uh, which I, I couldn't for re company reasons put here, but you can, of course, formulate the EVs and increase circulation. Uh, but we are still talking about, you know, hours. Um, yeah. I guess my question is related. So how much do you need to inject for in vivo vector? So when we've done the, in, in the inflammation models and also for our biodistribution, we are usually at in between one E10 to one E11 vesicles. We never dose based on protein, which is another thing that uh, is a problem within the EV field, because if you dose by protein, it will be very dependent on the purification method because if you have impurities, the protein doesn't say anything. So we dose based on particles. Okay, thanks. Uh, for, for the data, you show that there's underrepresentation of the microRNAs in your uh, small RNA distribution in exosome. So that means uh, by nature, the microRNAs is not enriched in exosome. <laughs> Yes, my, my, so this is my, of course, my view. Yeah, no, I don't, I think they are, they are, the minor part of microRNAs are secreted in exosomes. But what I didn't show is, and it's interesting and relevant, and I should have included it, it's actually only the exosome fraction that can transfer the microRNA to recipient cells. So even if you have very low copy numbers, we can see a, a, a difference in the CTs if running qPCR in a recipient cell. So even the ones that are LDL or HDL or AGO2 bound or whatever they are bound to, these are not transferred, not in our experiments at least. Okay, so but do you think uh, it's a good idea to use exosome to deliver uh, microRNAs? Yeah, it seems to work. So I, yes, I I'm, I'm very much think that it's a good idea. It's just we need to understand like the limitations and try to increase this loading uh, aspect. Deliver like naked microRNA or microRNA and AGO2. In the risk format or naked microRNAs? I, th I think this, Joshua will probably touch upon that in his talk. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, so I'm wondering um, what happens to your decoy exosomes? Do they get taken up by cells and degraded or what, what happens? You're almost like from a pharma, uh, it's interesting, I had a meeting with a pharma company last Friday and that was exactly the question. Actually, we don't know that. I think it's a combination that they, they are in circulation and that some are transferred to the, to the recipient tissue. Uh, and we know that, you know, independent of cell source, most of these, so EVs are really interesting because they have tropes, but global biodistribution is the same for EVs as with any other nanoparticles that we've looked at. So liver, you know, the RES system is still the main accumulation sites. Have you had an opportunity to compare the commercially available columns with the strategy you're using? And yeah. Yeah. That? Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. Shouldn't probably not make uh, adverts here, but I think the the, the ISON columns are pretty good, especially if you want to uh, use biological fluids, plasma, and so on. I think Rink Newland, who who was the, actually the first to really emphasize the work on on size exclusion, did a good job there. So, uh, but they are not scale, I mean, they are not, they are good for certain things, but not when we have massive sample preps and, and, and they are quite easily saturated if we have a lot of EVs. Uh, I think what we propose is, and, and also of course we want to, at some point, hopefully, be able to use this clinically and then we need a closed system of purification all the way. 
I have a comment actually. So you, one of your slides showed that uh, if you use the alteral centrifugation method, you're getting, or you think you're getting more aggregates and that's why the biodistribution changes. We've seen, actually when we labeled extracellular vesicles and, uh, with bioluminescence or, or mm. fluorescence and we inject them to the mice, we, we actually see, this, we see the same thing. So we see a lot of them go through the lung yep. and spleen. Yep. So most likely you're saying that because we're, we're pro we did purify them with ultrasonification. Yep. So most likely we're getting that because of these aggregates. Yes, that's what I believe. Because with, uh, with, with the LC, we see so low amounts in the lungs. So from therapeutic perspective, this could be a problem, right? Because these aggregates could yes. probably lead to toxicity or other things. Yes, that's what I believe. And I have a question. So what would be the functional role of ribosomal RNA transfer? Yeah, it's a good... Because it's already like the, the main RNAs in a cell, so... I'm yeah, I think it, maybe it's also, again, this direct energy or providing, uh, you know, it's everything that's translation related is upregulated in the EVs, especially if the EVs are, as the cells are under stress condition. So I didn't show that here, but we've also done a lot of proteomics where we, you know, induce different types of stress on the producer cells, and then you will see uh, geo, geo enrichments coming up that are basically protecting against stress. So I don't know if that could be uh, the explanation. Like a burst of like. Yeah, I, that's, that's what, how I would interpret it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Smith. Thank you. All right, we are gonna move on to the next speaker who is Joshua Leonard from uh, uh, Northwestern University uh, in uh, Evanston, Illinois. And uh, the title of the talk is Loading of Extracellular Vesicles with Nucleic Acid. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for the chance to talk, and thanks to Samir for the great introduction here. So I think this will dovetail nicely with some of the discussion we just had here. Uh, I decided, knowing that I'd go in this position, to focus this talk really on sort of a survey of various different methodologies one uses to load nucleic acids into, uh, into EVs. And so for that purpose, I'll go through many things across a, a couple different swaths here. I think for the sake of anyone who just walked in here, I'm just going to briefly say EVs are very interesting and are potentially very useful for therapeutic applications. That was the subject of the last talk, largely. And uh, at a high level, we can think about these EVs as being divided into subsets called exosomes, which originate in the endosomal compartment, and microvesicles, which originate at the cell surface. But as we just talked about for the last half an hour, that is a vast oversimplification having to do with both the heterogeneity of the vesicles and the methodology by which we isolate these populations. So everything I say is caveated with that observation, that there's a lot of difference within these groups, but rather I'll talk about kind of the general trends we see across these different methodologies here. So um, the subject of this talk is looking at nucleic acid loading. And I'm going to organize the talk into a couple of different sections here. So the first part, I'm going to talk about what we know, to some extent, about natural loading of nucleic acids into vesicles. And I'll uh, talk about a few things that are similar and different to the last speaker here. I'll talk about why that's so important from a therapeutic perspective. And really, the last two sections then are thinking about how do we actively increase the loading of certain cargos into EVs for therapeutic purposes. So the first part here is understanding the rules, or what's been done really to help understand the rules. Uh, I'd argue that of all the aspects of exosome biology or EV biology, RNA loading and nucleic acid loading is perhaps the most well studied, but there are still a lot of big questions here. So we're gonna try to focus on those and how they might impact applications as well. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is claim that understanding natural EV loading is crucial for translation of EV therapeutics, irrespective of how, at the end of the day, you try to load nucleic acids into EVs. And the reason is, understanding by the processes by which uh, these natural loading events occur could be useful for developing and optimizing production or for figuring out what you should monitor during production, but also because, of course, EVs have intrinsic biological activity, and it's still a relatively important and open question as to how that's going to impact some of the things we're trying to accomplish with EVs as therapeutic vesicles. Those naturally loaded microRNAs and so on may have effects that are beneficial or, or not, depending on what application we're looking at here. So why do we, what do we know about natural loading mechanisms? So as was mentioned last talk, some of the earliest work in this area looked at essentially discovering that microRNA, the RNA was present in these vesicles. And this is from uh, a, a number of authors, uh, Sandra Brakefeld and Jan Lutfeld's group showed that, for example, there are RNAs present in these and that, in general, the RNAs inside the vesicle population was shorter than what you find inside of the cellular RNAs. 
they reported a variety of different types of, micro, of RNAs, sorry, that could be identified into those, uh, into those populations. And in, in this methodology, anyway, few uh, ribosomal RNAs and DNAs were detected in those vesicle populations. So the general observation at the beginning of this field was that there seems to be some sort of sorting mechanism involved here. And we've done a number of studies since then, the field has, and I'm just mentioning one that's relatively recent here that uses a systematic sequencing analysis here. And in this case, these were vesicles derived from a co-culture of dendritic cells and T cells. And I'll just show you a couple of different stories uh, or lessons, really, that this sequencing analysis uh, showed for us. So the first is that with this highly sensitive sequencing analysis, nearly every type of RNA you can think of was identified to some extent in these vesicle populations. Now, the relative abundance was, again, not the same between the cells that produce the vesicles and the vesicles themselves, so that lesson is consistent. And if you stare at this long enough, you can see some rank ordering. And again, I think the lesson we're finding is that that ranking may be different between different cell types, but some general trends may be more similar. And so in particular, if we look at microRNAs, there is this very dramatic effect, though, that even within a given type of RNA, the abundance does not predict the loading. And that may be a little different than, than how we talked about this a moment ago, or another facet compared to what we talked about a moment ago. There appear to be mechanisms that discriminate between RNAs of the same type. And that's one of the general lessons that we're really interested in trying to focus on now, particularly if we're interested in excluding or including one of those types of cargos into our ultimate product here. So uh, if you kind of look at this at a quantitative level, this is a nice study kind of finding out how many RNAs per vesicle really do you get. And of course, that's important for looking at potency and efficacy of an EV product. And so in this analysis here, we look at a series of rankings of different microRNAs from a number of different sources here. So if you guys can see the pointer on the left here, this is just showing this methodology was applied to a number of different types of producer cells. And then in each one of those cases, looking at the highest, most abundant microRNA present in one of those populations and saying what, what quantitatively, though, uh, is the number of RNAs present per vesicle in any one of those most abundant microRNAs here. And the take home here is that even those really abundant microRNAs are present at, on average at far less than one copy. And this dovetails with what Samir told with some of his own data as well. And there's a couple different ways to think about why this is. Uh, this is a nice conceptual model proposed here. So we know from all the analyses we've talked about that reality lies somewhere in one of these bottom two models here. Uh, what we don't know yet are whether that rare microRNA is sort of randomly distributed through these EV populations or whether there are single uh, EVs that have large numbers of particular types of RNAs here. And again, that might suggest a different approach as to how ultimately we either bias production or bias purification at the end of the day to get the effect that we want. And so this is a nice conceptual model, which, which hasn't been demonstrated yet, but, but is an active area of investigation, as, as was mentioned. So what go rules govern this RNA loading? So there's a number of different insights we have into that question, and I'll survey some of the key findings that led us to this. So one of the first uh, studies to look at this systematically was uh, the study by the Kirchner and colleagues, which used a unbiased ab initio analysis of RNA sequences to see if anything was enriched within the RNAs that you find within the EB preps here. And uh, the three plots I'm showing you here are th or three curves I'm showing you here from their paper are three sequences that were found to be highly enriched in these EVs compared to in the producing cells. And they used a nice uh, quantitative rank ordering to identify those sequences. And moreover, it looks like those sequences don't appear randomly within the relative position on the RNA. They happen all across different portions of the RNA. And in this particular study, uh, it was shown that this sequence motif family here tends to show up a lot in long non-coding RNAs. And that's, by and large, what's being represented in this fraction right here. So if we look at different types of RNA, there might be different rules that apply to different types. And so this is a study from Senator Brickfield's group showing that uh, in this case, there are certain sequences that are enriched in EVs and that function as mRNA zip codes for actively loading these uh, mRNAs into EVs. And in this case, inclusion of this particular motif that was discovered bioinformatically on its own causes some increase in loading here. But that uptake is even, or that increase is even more dramatic when co-expressed with a microRNA that seems to interact physically with that particular loading motif or maybe mediate interaction with proteins that facilitate the active loading that uh, Samir mentioned in the last talk here. MicroRNAs may well follow some sort of similar rules here. I mentioned already that there seems to be a discrepancy between cellular abundance and vesicle abundance for microRNAs. 
And a couple of key insights into this are, are what I'm showing on the slide here. So on the left is a study from the PEGTEL lab looking at what types of non-templated RNA additions tend to correlate with either overrepresentation or underrepresentation in the EVs versus the cells. And these are two motifs that were identified. So in this case, this three prime adenylation of microRNA seems to lead to enrichment in the cells, maybe retention in the cells instead of in the EVs, whereas this three prime uh, uridylated uh, and micro microRNA are enriched in the secreted vesicles compared to the cells. And uh, another study was shown here on the right here, um, looking at a similar sort of motif here, and it was found that there is a sequence motif that seems to be uh, correlated with loading of microRNAs here. And they, in this case, uh, implicated an interaction with this ATB1, although again, I'm just mentioning this again, to some extent these rules may not be exclusive in the sense that different preparations may lead to slightly different uh, conclusions as to how this works. But this could be said that this interaction between the sequence and the protein makes sense for at least a population of the cells here. So DNA as well can be loaded. I mentioned this was sort of uh, hard to find earlier on, but with sensitive analysis, it's now pretty clear that DNA gets loaded into EVs as well. And so here are a couple of studies looking at natural DNA loading here. So in this case, this is DNA that is uh, being loaded into these uh, vesicles here, and we're in particular looking at what types of DNA is found here. So single-stranded DNA seems to be more prevalent than double-stranded DNA. And since these are medulloblastoma cells, cancer cells with the large repeats of certain uh, oncogenes, those sequences tend to be also overrepresented in the DNA that you find in these uh, vesicles, which is part of what made this very exciting from a standpoint of diagnostics, which, which I'm not talking about today. But obviously, diagnostics is intimately tied to the uh, understanding of these rules of loading as well. Um, and in uh, this other study here I'm showing you from the Leiden group, David Leiden's group, looked at when you have this uh, B16 melanoma cell line and you look at where in the genome do these DNA chunks come from, it looks like there are chunks from pretty much the whole genome you can find in that vesicle population. So there's an argument to be made that irrespective of sort of the differences in the heights of these frequencies, you get some sampling of a huge fraction of the genome of these cells by simply looking at the secreted DNA population. Again, very important from a diagnostic standpoint, potentially challenging from a therapeutic manufacturing standpoint. If you're making your vesicles in cancer cells, some of those oncogenes could get into your vesicles, just to put a pin on that. Whether that's a real problem or not is still out there, but there is, there is some concern that this is a connection that, that matters in practice here. So the next two tar parts of the talk here are going to really think about, now that we kind of know something about how this works naturally, how do we think about taking those insights and maybe modifying those with some engineering approaches to do, act, to do uh, intentional loading of these vesicles here? And so for the sake of sort of conceptual organization, I'm dividing this up into two separate chunks, one in which we imagine we do something to the cells and then harvest the vesicles, and that's part two. And the second is we harvest the vesicles and then do stuff to them, and that's part three. They are not distinct, and there'll be some tie-ins, but this is a nice way of kind of thinking about um, how, how we can survey this overall landscape. So one of the first, uh, this is actually the only study from my laboratory that I'm going to present for the talk today here, but it c comes at the front of this because of a particular reason. So it's useful to think about uh, natural loading of these things as being either active or passive at a very high level. And so passive would simply be mass action driven, active would be mediated by some sort of specific interaction. And we talked about the fact that we think both those processes are involved in, in natural loading as well. So what we did in this study from a couple years back is develop an engineered system that serves as a biotechnology or a model system to separate the question of what is loaded into vesicles versus what can be loaded into vesicles. And that's the way to think about this experimental system. So what we did is take a number of vesicle-associated proteins, proteins that we know are enriched in certain vesicle fractions, and just fuse those to the MS2 bacteriophage coat protein, which binds a specific RNA motif. And so we can investigate how well a particular RNA that bears that stem loop gets loaded in the presence of this highly, uh, this, um, highly loaded protein that grabs onto that RNA versus in the absence of this. So sort of fake virus uh, biology in a way. So what we're trying to do then is figure out when we look at the RNAs that are loaded passively and actively, to what extent does this active loading really change anything? So just to kind of show you that this works, these are some data um, coming from either exosomes or microvesicles. And so we're differentially separating these using differential centrifugation protocols, as was mentioned before. So we get relatively um, uh, distinct preparations here. And in each case, we're using a different uh, protein to load the RNA. 
So we're using LAMP2B for exosomes, and we're using the VSVG uh, uh, glycoprotein to load RNA for vesicles that come from the cell surface. And so the point of this slide is that basically this works, so you can get active loading. Um, this is pretty dramatic here, so about 40-fold for the case of the microvesicles here. But this, this actually is uh, both practical, but also for the sake of today's talk, a tool for figuring out, you know, what is the difference in these loading processes. So just one quick summary slide on, on what we showed there, because this data is published. We show that you can uh, load RNA up to basically the biggest mRNA we tried. This is Cas9 for obvious reasons. Um, we could load Cas9 actively um, with uh, a 5.4 kb mRNA. Um, they got up to 40-fold enrichment in RNA loading uh, versus passive alone. And I should say passive loading in this case is uh, a special kind of passive loading in which we overexpress the heck out of the RNA. So it's kind of best case scenario passive loading as far as uh, we could achieve in this system. So that alone was still far less rich than for the active loading case. And both active and passive loading were much more efficient for smaller RNA, which is no surprise. Matches some of the initial data from the field, and also some of the, uh, some of the studies that were mentioned in the last presentation as well. So you can get loading of large RNA. You may need to do active loading for large RNA. For smaller RNA, mass action may not be different than what we're seeing with this active loading situation. But um, as we have been talking a little bit about, how that efficiency matches to efficacy is something we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Okay, so this just says active versus passive is one thing that matters, especially when you're trying to load things that are derived from the producer cell uh, during the production of the EVs. Another way of doing uh, loading during production is a relatively widely explored approach now, relatively newer, but relatively widely explored. And so the general approach here is really to take your EV producing cells and just transiently, immediately or shortly before harvest, introduce your nucleic acids via transfection into those EV producing cells here. And so the cartoon is just showing us some generic transfection reagent, loading some RNA, or in, in this case RNA, into the cell, waiting a bit, and then harvesting the vesicles that come from this. And so there are now a number of different approaches that, uh, that do this. I point you towards this nice review uh, from a few authors we've been speaking about here that talks about some of these studies. They all show kind of the same thing that I'm showing here, which is that you can do this with pretty much any type of RNA cargo or any type of uh, nucleic acid cargo, probably. Uh, a big unique advantage of this approach is that you can use chemically modified nucleic acids for stability or tolerability, immune tolerance. To do that, you really need to use something kind of like this and when you're producing these things in the cells here, uh, although we'll talk about one alternative later on as well. So some challenges, though, are that once these RNAs get into the cell, you're still subject to the same rules of passive loading that I talked about in the last slide here. And so what's been shown so far is that your efficiency of loading these RNA into the vesicles is still relatively low. Uh, it, it, it happens, but it's still relatively low and an opportunity for, for improving this approach. Uh, the other thing that gets challenging is if your cargo impacts the biology of your EV-producing cell, then that may be bad. Uh, in particular, if that lowers, in some extent, EV loading or causes the expression of inflammatory genes that may be transferred along with your product, that's one layer of biomanufacturing complexity that hasn't been sussed out yet with this approach, but would ultimately need to be part of doing this. Uh, Scale-up can be a little challenging with this as well. I think Samir did a great job of talking about how that is at the heart of some of these questions here. Uh, and for example, if you're going to transiently transfect before you produce, that can be done at large scale, but that's more challenging than if you're simply growing your cells um, under, under high-density cultures here. And the final concern that I put in bold here, because uh, many folks, including the authors of I think every one of these papers, has raised, is that the inclusion of transfection reagents in your production step means that you'll probably have some of those transfection reagents in your final preparation. And, and the reason is they, they partition into the membranes here. They sometimes form particles that are difficult to separate um, from the EV particles. It may be a solvable problem, but it's certainly something that one should think about if considering this methodology here. And there's some active work at trying to actually solve those problems uh, as well. So another way to think about this question of loading is of uh, loading nucleic acids is you can use tricks from other systems here. So this is a study coming from a Casey McGuire's group, and he'll be speaking tomorrow morning at an exosome section, so go to that. Uh, this is a technology called vexosomes, which is a great coinage, by the way. I, I always give props to that, but the vexosomes in this case are exosomes loaded with viruses, and in this case they're loaded with AAV. And the nice, uh, the nice thing about this is you don't really have to do anything to cause the vesicles to be loaded with AAV. You simply harvest the secreted vesicles instead of lysing the cells to retrieve the particles. 
And so this uh, was shown to be effective. It potentially shields these viral particles from the immune system, which of course everyone in this audience will appreciate. Uh, manufacturing is a challenge in this system as well that's being investigated. But this is potentially a way of nu loading nucleic acids indirectly and, and maybe even having some effect enhancement, which is uh, sort of beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today. So the final, talk, uh, final section here uh, of my presentation is going to be loading nucleic acids after you've already harvested the vesicles here. So in general, this cartoon just kind of reminds you that there are these two different ways of loading. So everything we've talked about so far involves stuff you do to the cells, and then you harvest the vesicles. And if you're going to load things after you've harvested the vesicles, there are pretty much uh, two main ways of doing this. You either have to use a cargo that naturally partitions into those vesicles. So for example, hydrophobic uh, compounds can, can diffuse across that membrane and get into the side of this for drugs, which we're not talking about today. But everything else involves some sort of perturbation that loads those RNAs into the vesicles here. And so I'll start with the one that you see at the top of the slide there. So electroporation is, by and large, the most widely explored methodology for loading uh, things into vesicles after they've been harvested here. And as you know, the general idea here is the application of this electric field transiently disrupts the wall, or the, the membrane of the vesicle, and enables mass action-driven flow between whatever's outside the vesicle into the vesicle here. And so, of course, one thing to think about before I show you any data is that vesicles are very small, their environments are very big. This works best if you have very high concentrations of things on the outside in order to have any chance of getting mass action-driven loading here. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a methodology that's been, that's been pretty widely tried and used to successful ends in several ways here. So um, one of the challenges with this approach that's now been widely explored, uh, including by Matthew Wood's group and a number of others who've studied this in, uh, in subsequent years, is that I, I mentioned why electroporation might not be expected to work too well using this mass action argument. That's been done well mathematically. Uh, but also we can see some other issues that can be kind of challenging here. So one of the main uh, concerns that's been raised is that you get particle formation in this kind of a scenario in a way that doesn't even require the presence of the exosomes. And so if you look at this methodology, uh, this uh, data shown from the Kudjimens et al. study, they're looking at the number of particles you find. If you have vesicles alone, if you have vesicles and, uh, and uh, the siRNA that have been electroporated, but if you just electroporate them alone, you get particles. There's no vesicles in this big black bar right there. And so that's their point, is that you get this aggregation effect. And to some extent, this can be mitigated in some ways. So choice of conditions, choice of electrode metal, it turns out, has a big influence on this. Uh, but to some extent, aggregation of these siRNAs is an interesting uh, challenge here. Uh, the other thing is, even if you control for that, it's not really clear when you get these complexes whether the uh, siRNA in this example is going into the vesicles versus onto the vesicles. Okay? And this is one of those things that turns out to be relatively challenging to investigate and is sometimes not always investigated um, as well as maybe it could be here. And so we don't know whether the effects that we're seeing, which by the way, um, I'm not going to show you, but some of the effects in the literature may well be due to the problems I'm mentioning to you. So that may still confer a functional effect even within the context of the limitations I'm mentioning here. Big area that we're looking at, but, but this is uh, a pretty, pretty well characterized space at this point. Uh, the other thing is that it looks like some cargo RNA may not be particularly well loaded by this approach. And especially as things get larger, that starts to make sense. But even relatively small uh, microRNA, for example, don't go in all that well by electroporation in a few reports that have looked at this systematically. And so maybe there's a better way to get cargo like that into the vesicles. Uh, a recent and, and pretty cool uh, uh, other way of loading things into these vesicles was reported by Stephen Jay's group. And I'm just showing you two aspects of this particular study. So on the left here, they're looking at the loading of siRNAs by a sonication. And in particular, they're comparing that loading efficiency by sonication to what you'd get by a, a pretty state-of-the-art electroporation protocol here. And so the spread going up in this plot here is indicating that you get far better loading of these siRNAs, which are fluorescently labeled by sonication, compared to by electroporation. And when you do it this way, you do end up getting a functional knockdown of a target gene, which of course is the, is the thing to check. It's not as good as if you simply transfect the siRNA, which may be, uh, but it's still a very pronounced effect here. And so this looks like maybe a promising way to get over some of those barriers that I mentioned. And of course, sonication doesn't require the use of any new transfection reagents uh, or any new materials like that. Uh, another really promising approach here that maybe you'll uh, hear about if you come to tomorrow's exosome section, I'm plugging this again. So this is Anastasia 
Kurova's uh, study, uh, which was the first in a couple of papers looking at the idea of using tagging of nucleic acids with hydrophobic moieties that facilitate this mass action driven loading here. And so this little cartoon is just showing you the modifications that were done to this particular cargo. There's a cholesterol moiety at the end, which facilitates crossing over or associating with that hydrophil, uh, hydrophobic um, EV membrane. And then, of course, highlighting the advantage of using this approach, you can make nice chemical modifications of your cargo here uh, in a way that uh, is uniquely facilitated by this loading um, of synthetic RNAs or synthetic uh, nucleic acids. And so the, pro the cartoon is just kind of showing you how easy this is. You take your two things, mix them together, spin them down. Of course, this does require downstream uh, separation, as was mentioned by Samir in the last presentation. But from the standpoint of feasibility analysis here, this is what they did in this case here. And so a couple of, interest, couple of uh, interesting points here. So this cholesterol tagging uh, does facilitate loading into the EVs or maybe onto the EVs or maybe both. And I think both studies kind of left both those, raised both those questions wisely and uh, uh, left that as a possible um, question for further investigation you can get relatively high loading of your input siRNA. So in this case, uh, especially in uh, this latter study, they did a nice study looking at the relative ratios of the vesicles and the siRNA and showed that if you have an excess of these vesicles, you can incorporate a large fraction of your input siRNA. So there doesn't seem to be necessarily uh, a barrier that can't be overcome if you're, if you're looking at trying to get good association here. And finally, uh, both studies show that this delivery is, is of course, functional for gene uh, knockdown, and that's important. So finally, I'm kind of lumping the loading of DNA into one slide here. You can do things like this for loading of DNA as well. And I'm just showing you this is really borrowed from the latter two sections of the presentation here. In this first study over here from the contact group, they showed that plasmid DNA, if you transfect it into the cells, in this case just using standard lipofectamine 2000, you do get loading and you do get functional gene delivery in recipient cells to which these particles were delivered. And uh, Stephen Jay's group again showed in this more recent study that you can also take the latter approach, harvest the vesicles first, and then load those, uh, load those DNA molecules into the vesicles after the fact. And some key findings here were that linear DNA molecules were more efficiently loaded than circular plasmid DNA molecules. And if you go up to about a KB, that efficiency is pretty good, and then it goes down for a larger one. So maybe one of these things that can be put together with some of the other methodologies here, but DNA can be loaded just like uh, RNA, which is not too surprising. So finally, there's a neat uh, set of approaches uh, folks have investigated, which is the use of hybrid vesicles. And this is the principle that maybe the vesicles have some attractive properties, and a synthetic vehicle might have some attractive properties. Uh, for example, it's easy to reconstitute your RNA cargo in, when making the liposomes, and you can get the loading to be pretty high in that context here. So this idea was to maybe fuse those two types of vesicles together by using compatible lipid compositions here to ultimately get these hybrid vesicles that maybe take the best of both worlds. So for example, if you engineer surface proteins for targeting, then that could come from the e EV. And if you want to have high loading of the cargo moiety or decoration with non-natural lipids, for example, or uh, PEG to shield uh, the vesicle surface, that can maybe be done on the synthetic side here. So this is sort of a hybrid synthetic biological manufacturing methodology here. Um, of course, there are some challenges that come with this as well, which is, of course, you retain the, all those lipids from both the sources here. So you have both the advantages and disadvantages of both of those. And it hasn't been totally fleshed out as to how that, um, that particular facet impacts things like toxicity, biological activity, potential for fusion with recipient cells. That's not the context of this talk today, but fusion of your vesicle with the recipient cell is limiting in, in every study that's been really looking at that question so far, much as it is for nanoparticles and other uh, sort of delivery technologies. Uh, we know it happens more for some types of vesicles than for others, but how this could maybe be used to improve that hasn't really been uh, too systematically explored yet. So finally, I'm just taking another uh, page. This is another uh, table from this nice review I'm pointing you towards here uh, that makes the point that really we have a lot of data showing that you can get efficacy for EV loading by uh, many of the approaches that I talked about today. So whether we're doing electroporation, transfection of the producer cells, or one of the other active loading or uh, biochemical loading methodologies I talked to you about, there are now nice data showing that you can do this with RNA and of various sorts, as well as with DNA, and that you can get therapeutic effects in animals for many of these studies as well. So for full references, I'm deferring to this for the sake of legibility here, but there is a wide smattering here, and that's maybe the reason why this room is so crowded today. So I think there's a lot of stuff to be done, and we do know a lot of things today as well. So I think with my last uh, two minutes, perfect, um, I just wanted to leave us on this slide. <clears throat> 
some summary and some closing thoughts, maybe some questions uh, for you, but these are questions that we are asking in the field as well here. So uh, the main take home is there exists a big menu here, and I think how all these things impact, for example, loading after biogenesis, uh, or, or before biogenesis, um, there's a big menu of things to be explored. This dovetails many ways with functional delivery, with purification and manufacturing. How all those things connect is a really important and translational question that um, is at the forefront of this area here. And I'm just raising a couple things that maybe are, are summarizing a few of the questions I raised earlier on during the talk that I think are important to really be thinking about here. So what are the consequences of incorporating these natural cell-derived species into the, uh, and I should add proteins to that list as well, metabolites, uh, into EVs? Uh, we know, for example, there aren't giant negative effects from the studies that have been done so far, but once this gets into people and becomes more subtle, this is going to become an increasingly important question to think about here. And so, um, to some extent, we may want to see if we can use some of these phenomena I've told you about so far to answer that question. So if it turns out there are particularly problematic microRNA, then maybe you can knock them out if you have a cell line that's stable. Um, but if you can't do that, maybe there are some other ways to exclude potential cargo from your vesicles if it turns out that you uh, need to for the safety or for, for efficacy reasons. Finally, this methodology question is just at the heart of this whole place. Which of these methods are most amenable to scale up in manufacturing? Can we, from the beginning, do some focus on that question to help uh, get at the most effective and rapid paths to translation and uh, commercial success? Finally, how does the choice of this cargo impact these balances between potency, safety, and efficacy? I sort of raised the same questions for many of the different phenomena we had here, but certainly those balances are struck differently for the different loading technologies we've talked about here. And finally, we have this question that um, how do all these things impact function and toxicity and dose in vivo? Are there ways that we can take the best of both worlds from synthetic del gene delivery vehicles and EVs and ultimately come up with a product that strikes a better balance between these different uh, things we're trying to achieve? Okay? And I just want to highlight why this is so important. Remember my cartoon of the mostly empty vesicles with a few in there? So potency, toxicity, and efficacy are really limit are really um, really, really tightly located uh, in the same question, as you all know. So for example, if you use a lipid that confers really efficient loading, and you only need to then use a very small amount of that, you may well be able to stay below the toxicity threshold for that particular lipid when, when you go to translation. Whereas if you have low density loading, you may need to use a lot more vesicles, which is a lot more uh, expensive and so on, right? So I think these questions are really not decouplable in that sense. And uh, I think I'm going to leave this slide up here for the sake of the discussion session, okay? So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Thanks. I have a question about the hybrid vesicles. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at from the other side, what is the advantage EVs bring to the, for example, lipid nanoparticles? Right. So some of the major advantages, as, as uh, Samir highlighted, were that there, some of these issues of toxicity and maybe stability in vivo seem to be advantageous for these vesicles. There, there are some evidence also that particular types of delivery are more efficient when mediated by these vesicles. And, and to some extent, that may have to do with protein-protein interactions between EV proteins and recept uh, receptor cells. And to some extent, that may have to do with lipid composition, and we don't necessarily know what, that rules, what those rules are. But I think that's the idea, is really safety, gene efficiency, uh, gene delivery efficiency, and I mean delivery to the cytoplasm in this case, may be bit advantageous for the vesicles at this point. And of course, I mentioned some of the advantages of the other approach as well. My question kind of touches on some of your open questions, but mm. has anyone looked at the difference or the magnitude of the difference between the undesirable components that are in the vesicles um, when you're manually loading after purification? That has been studied to some extent, I would say within a given case, and, and maybe there is a different answer for different cases, but you can do, for example, you know, dose escalation studies and look at the incidence of this. I think for most of the studies I'm showing you, they're in the last year or so. That hasn't yet been systematically evaluated, but my guess, I mean, that's pointed out by the authors as a question in the study. I suspect those are on, under active investigation by some of those. I have a comment actually on the active loading. Great. So you mentioned they, uh, you can do up to 5.4 kilos of bases. Right. So, but how is that compared to, uh, for instance, overexpression in the cell or transfection? What, what is it before, before uh, picking them up? 
Because I thought the size would be much lower in that case. Yeah, so, so, that's the, so that's the slide from my group, from our paper, just to remind everybody what that question is. We were trying to see the effect of active loading versus passive loading. So in that case, the passive loading is under conditions of really high overexpression. And so we actually take the same scenario. It's the same cell line that genetically has been engineered with lentiviruses to express the cargo RNA at very high levels. And then we simply then transiently express either the loading protein or a non-functional control protein there. So the differences I quoted for you are, are for these really large cargo RNAs. And yeah, the active loading of those cargo RNAs that are very large was much less than 40-fold in that. Well, not much less than 40-fold, but it was smaller than it was for, for those. The, the cargo, I didn't say this part, but the, the data I showed you were for a cargo mRNA of about 2 kb um, for that study. And one thing I should say is that in that paper, we also looked at both full-length mRNA loading, which are the numbers I quoted, and also fragment loading. And so the other part of that story is that the fragments are loaded way more efficiently than the full-length mRNAs. And in fact, that seems to give us a lot of insights into these size rules as well. So you load your, your representation of fragments in the vesicles is far higher than your representation of, us, of those fragments in the cells. And that's true for both active and passive loading. Seems to be um, uh, an effect that goes with that methodology. Too. And how does the active uh, loading work? Is it, so you mentioned you use VSVG, for instance. Is right. It, you just mix things together and it just happens because some charge is involved? Yeah, so the way the active loading occurs in that system is VSVG has been engineered, VSVG or LAMP2B was genetically engineered to include the bacteriophage MS2 coat protein on the cytosolic face of the cells and there on the side of the luminal face of all the vesicles. And so the cargo RNAs are an exogenous RNA engineered to have a uh, stem loop, or actually it's a couple of stem loops that bind with high affinity to the MS2 cargo protein. And so it's a very high avidity and affinity binding event that mediates the loading of the RNA into the cargo. And I, I would say there are some approaches that have been developed since then that would enable you to do that kind of binding reversibly. For our money, that was really helping us to understand in a best case scenario, if it binds really tightly forever, what are the rules governing loading with that? Has, any, has anyone compared the, the EV system to viral vectors? See, you know, the purpose is to deliver the cargo to express uh, M, uh, different RNAs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you, the procedure you proposed are pretty much a similar possibly to, to produce viral vectors. I was wondering, you know, the purpose is the same. What would be the advantage to use the EV system compared to virus? Unless, you know, immunogenicity and then other uh, issue is a problem. I, I, I have trouble to rationalize the clear advantage of EV system compared to virus. Sure, so I'll answer on behalf of the field. No, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at sort of my, my thought on that because I think it's a great question. And to some extent, what folks have looked at with EV delivery of the type I talked about, these are transient gene expression um, goals for the most part. So mRNA, microRNA, siRNA, transient modulation is the goal there. And yes, you, you got it right. I think the reason most people are excited about this is the hope that this would um, elude some of the problems of eventual um, immunogenicity. In particular, that ties back to my transient argument. So if you're going to do this multiple times, then obviously immunogenicity becomes more important to think about than if it's a single administration type of event. Here. And for those reasons, transient cargos, for example, gene modifying uh, nucle uh, nucleases, are the type of cargo you may well want to deliver in, in this sort of a fashion and not deliver them in a sustained fashion. We, we all know this from Cas9, that sustained expression might be detrimental compared to a transient expression of those sort of cargos. And so I think those are two of the reasons people tend to look at this. Um, compared to viral vectors, but I guess I think it would have to be very application specific to answer your question legitimately. So I think for a given application, which vector is most appropriate probably may be different for, for different applications. I think it's probably the fairest way to, to answer the question. You can take that last question just for a quick, quick, and then... Sure, just, just a brief question. Uh, do you see any possibility of modifying signaling, intracellular signaling to shift more nucleic acids during spontaneous loading? 
towards I'll, MVB instead of... Uh, a lot of folks are interested in that. So, for example, one can imagine there's some ongoing work. Uh, Samir mentioned a little bit on this, too, I think. But uh, one can imagine taking a chemical library and looking at what sorts of chemical perturbations give rise to different types of loading. So, for example, there are some known perturbations that cause changes in the levels of certain EVs being produced. If you uh, modify lipid metabolism, you can shift the limiting step in uh, EV biogenesis to incorporate, uh, to produce more vesicles in some cases. Certain types of stress events increase vesicle shedding. How that impacts what's loaded is less well characterized, but one can imagine that's, that's an approach you could take as well. Yeah. All right, I think we are run out of time. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is... Uh, Alisa Waver from uh, Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee. And she's going to uh, talk about trafficking of extracellular vesicles, biogenesis, release, uptake, and paid. Great. Thank you very much. This has been a great session. I'm learning something, too, even though this is my field. Um, so I'm going to talk about the basic cell biology of how EVs are made and released and taken up. And being a basic cell biologist, I don't have any disclosures. Um, so as has been discussed uh, uh, briefly already, there are a variety of different extracellular vesicles that are released from cells. So um, we typically classify these into um, vesicles that bud from the cell surface. Um, uh, we, I typically, and many people typically, call these microvesicles. Um, so they're both small microvesicles that get shed from the cell surface and larger that bleb, bleb off. And then uh, we typically call exosomes the small vesicles that are released from the endocytic system, from multivesicular bodies. Um, and these vesicles interact with cells in a variety of ways, um, both through receptor ligand interactions and inducing direct signals. and uh, by being taken up and uh, delivering intravesical um, cargo for fusion. So I want to talk in a little bit of detail about how these different kinds of vesicles are made. Um, and I'm going to start with exosome biogenesis. We actually understand how exosomes are made better than how the microvesicles are made, um, but that's not to say that we uh, understand fully how they're made because it's still a heterogeneous uh, population of vesicles. Um, but a, a, a classic, um, uh, this is sort of a classic cartoon um, that, that shows routes of cargos being incorporated into vesicles. So uh, cell surface um, receptors can be internalized either um, via clafrin coated pits or via clafrin independent mechanisms. And a classic way that these cargos can get incorporated into exosomes um, is via ubiquitination and recognition by the escort machinery that, that then uh, makes these vesicles. Um, and there are additional um, methods that are escort um, independent that have been described that involve um, lipid modulation. And this leads to this second vesiculation event within uh, uh, early endosomes that, um, when they mature, um, become late endosomes and multivesicular bodies. Um, so for um, actually a, a couple of um, uh, decades, it was thought that the major pathway or the only pathway for these multivesicular bodies was degradative and that they fuse with the lysosome and that it's all degraded. Um, but now we know that a portion of these multivesicular bodies can dock and fuse with the plasma membrane to release exosomes. And actually, this decision point is probably uh, an important one for determining um, what gets secreted out into the extracellular medium. Um, perhaps what kinds of vesicles, if there are different MVBs, um, uh, but definitely the number of vesicles that are secreted. And so as I mentioned, uh, the sort of classic um, pathway that we think about um, for, excuse me, exosomes is um, internalization of uh, membrane proteins, so things that start on the plasma membrane and then are recognized by machinery and incorporated into exosomes. So if this is now the cytoplasm and this is the inside of the endosome, um, this vesiculation event 
uh, utilizes, um, the, uh, can utilize either the escort machinery or uh, more recently described other machineries to cause this vesiculation event. Um, and so the escort machinery consists of um, complexes of proteins that are actually classified as, as different complexes into zero, one, uh, two, three, and four. And it's basically a, a sequential machinery that recognizes cargo, uh, um, uh, de-ubiquitinates it once it's incorporated into this vesicle and forms a ring to actually pinch off these vesicles. The more recently described pathway for making these vesicles in multivesicular bodies, um, one of them uh, depends on ceramide synthesis. So the idea is that making certain lipids induces curvature naturally of the membrane. Um, and these are um, sort of lipid raft-rich lipid raft membrane regions. And so cargo proteins would be naturally incorporated based on their affinity for those lipids that, that are put into these vesicles. Now, while these have been described separately, um, I'll have to say I, I think that it is not totally established in the field that these are really separate pathways. So you can imagine a, a scenario where there's some cargo that's recognized by the escort machinery, um, but that lipid curvature could come into play as well to cooperate with um, cargo recognition, curvature, and membrane pinching off. And so this is an area that I think is still being um, explored. But uh, in some cases, it does look like certain proteins, such as this PLP protein, are um, dependent more on one pathway than, than another. Um, and also, there's a third pathway that's been described that uh, involves uh, tetraspanins. PLP is a tetraspanin-like molecule, but tetraspanins also can form these organized membrane regions. They're very prominent cargos in exosomes, often used as markers. and um, it's been shown that at least for one protein, they can organize those and, and induce those cargos to go into exosomes. Okay, so that's a lot of detail about exosomes. What, what about microvesicles? Um, so this is uh, also a heterogeneous group of vesicles that gets released from cells. I would say these are a bit less characterized than exosomes in terms of how they're made and um, uh, released from cells. Um, but there have been several mechanisms that have been described. So um, one is these uh, sort of large, larger vesicles that can get released from cells. And in fact, very large vesicles um, called large oncosomes can get released from um, cancer cells, but potentially other cells could do this as well. And um, uh, uh, a major factor there for these really large vesicles is, uh, involves actually uh, cytoskeletal reorganization. So membranes from cells tend to bleb when the actin uh, cortex that's here is weak, and so the plasma membrane can kind of bleb out from these actin pore areas. And this also depends on contractility, so by myosins to sort of force those blebs out and um, help promote pinching off. Um, small GTPase ARP6 has also been implicated in um, release of these microvesicles. And then for smaller vesicles, there are some other mechanisms that have been described. So um, Kirsi really, uh, sorry, Kirsi Rilla um, described a mechanism well, where hyaluronin production can induce a formation of protrusions, microvillar-like protrusions from cells, and um, this can lead to actual budding off of vesicles from the ends of these protrusions. Um, so again, maybe a charge kind of um, uh, mechanism uh, forces these changes in the, in the lipid curvature, potentially. Um, and uh, for sm uh, smaller vesicles from the surface of the plasma membrane, uh, yet some other mechanisms have been described. So um, there's a protein called ARRDC1. It's an uh, uh, arrestin-associated adapter protein that actually recruits the escort machinery. So it recruits the same machinery that makes exosomes. And it makes um, um, similar sized small vesicles that are actually indistinguishable in the preps if you prep using a typical exosome prep. Um, and um, 
so this is an interesting area. We don't really know if these vesicles are fundamentally different from the ones that are made inside multivesicular bodies because they tend to use the same machinery. And then again, lipid curvature is important here. So lipid flippases have been shown in um, model organisms actually um, to regulate the formation of these vesicles. So um, flipping lipids back and forth between the outer and inner leaflet of the plasma membrane is going to affect the curvature um, and is involved in um, either promoting or inhibiting formation of these small vesicles. Okay, so we've heard a bit about um, microRNA and other RNA trafficking pathways. Um, and this is an example of a cytosolic um, uh, component that gets trafficked specifically. So I, I told you already about membrane-bound endocytosed cargos or membrane-bound blebbed cargos. But what about these cytosolic components? Um, so uh, RNAs and microRNAs um, can get out of a cell in a variety of ways. So uh, they can come out uh, inside of exosomes. They can um, come out uh, as protein-associated complexes. Um, they're also found on the outside of lipoproteins, like uh, high-density lipoprotein. And also RNAs are incorporated into these larger um, microvesicles. So just to get back to these different cargo sorting mechanisms, so the ones I, I, I already described for you had to do with membrane-bound cargos. Um, but it's um, in, in many ways a bit more unclear how cytosolic cargos actually get into these exosomes. So there are some proteins that are known to bind to RNAs um, that can carry uh, RNAs but it's not really clear how they themselves are specifically associating with the machinery that makes these vesicles to get in. Um, so the, the, one of the first examples um, for specific um, you know, targeting of uh, microRNAs into exosomes uh, was uh, this HNRMPA2B1 protein. And um, one thing that's interesting about this protein is um, that it becomes uh, sumoylated, and this allows it to specifically recognize the, the, the motif in the microRNAs that it carries in. And so it's only the sumoylated form that, that goes into those exosomes. Um, and uh, it was not really clear at, at the time what the mechanism is for this sumoylated protein to actually sort with the membrane. Um, but there was a recent paper um, that showed for alpha-synuclein, which is a pathogenic protein in Parkinson's, that it could be uh, simulated and this could link it to escorts to take it into exosomes. So one possibility which I think needs to be explored is that uh, SUMO, uh, which is a similar modification to ubiquitin, which is well known to connect to the escorts, could be a second method um, to uh, go into um, vesicles. Um, but I have to say this is somewhat speculation because it's also been reported that um, uh, RNAs uh, often depend on the ceramide pathway to get into uh, exosomes, although how that happens is, is unclear. So I think this is an area that really needs to be fleshed out a lot more. Um, I do want to mention that some additional RNA binding proteins can sort uh, microRNAs into uh, uh, EVs. Um, so actually, we uh, showed that AGO2 can be specifically sorted into exosomes. Um, however, this is regulated by a signaling event that takes place on late endosomes. So there's a KRAS to MEC uh, signaling event that will phosphorylate AGO2 and remove it from multivesicular endosomes so that it sorts to processing bodies instead. Um, so if that signaling is active, you're going to see very little AGO2 in the exosomes. If it is not active, for example, in serum-starved cells, then uh, you're likely to see much more AGO2, um, and it will carry some microRNAs with it. <coughs> 
Some other examples of RNA binding proteins, I or already mentioned HNRMPA2B1. There's a protein called Syncrip that specifically recognizes some microRNAs. And uh, recently, YBX1 protein was also shown to recognize um, uh, some specific microRNAs. So in terms of the biogenesis, again, so how are these RNA binding proteins getting into exosomes, and are they in a certain population of exosomes? Um, it does appear that at least for two of these, some RNA binding proteins are found in CD63 positive exosomes. So these are um, a tetras this is a tetraspanin. So I told you these tend to go into these lipid ordered um, domains called tetraspanin en enriched microdomains. And um, we actually, uh, this is again from our um, paper in cell reports. Um, we found that if we immunoprecipitated exosomes with a CD63 antibody, um, we could, uh, so this is showing CD63 uh, coming down and not in our um, control IgG immunoprecipitation. The CD63 is depleted from the supernatant here, not with the IgG. Most of the AGO2 is depleted from the supernatant and ends up in the IP. But interestingly, TSG101, which is an escort protein, a little of it comes down in the IP, but most of it is actually not depleted from the supernatant, suggesting that these populations are not I identical um, and that there may be enrichment in the CD63 positive population. And in addition, the YBOX1 um, paper also used a CD63 immunoprecipitated exosome population um, uh, to um, uh, identify and find their um, specific RNA binding protein RNA um, interaction. So at least for two examples, um, this seems to be the case. Okay, so that's, um, I, I guess, uh, all I'm going to say about um, Biogenesis, what about EV addressability? So um, EVs do not appear to be randomly taken up, um, which you could see as, I guess, either an advantage or a disadvantage um, in targeting, depending on um, uh, what you're trying to do with the targeting. Um, and an example um, of that, uh, I, I guess there's some, some nice examples in, in cancer where exosomes secreted from different types of tumor cells um, are targeted to different organs. Um, and within those organs, distinct cell types seem to be targeted. Um, and um, it's thought that ligand receptor interactions are what are mediating these, so that this is a specific um, event. So I'm going to take some uh, examples just to substantiate those statements I just made from David Leiden's lab because I think his lab has done um, the, um, I guess, some strong work in this area to really make those points. Um, and so this is an example of uh, work from his organotropism paper um, where he showed that exosomes from different cancers are, are preferentially taken up by different tissues. So um, these are graphs showing um, uh, targeting of uh, exosomes that uh, come from different um, cell types um, and that they go basically to different organs. So um, these are two breast cancer cell lines. I think this is a pancreatic cancer cell line. This is a prostate cancer cell line. And you can see that depending on which cell line they were purifying exosomes from, uh, they either preferentially went to the lung in the case of MDA, MD231 cells, or to the liver, uh, um, such as this breast cancer cell line and, and the other two um, cancer cell lines. And if they took um, 231 cells that had been passed through mice and had a specific tropism, um, either for um, bone, lung, or brain, what they found was that uh, even though they, they originally came from the same cell line, um, the ones that had been, um, I guess, selected to have tropism for different organs, that the exosomes were taken up preferentially by those different organs. So the bone ones, um, uh, they didn't look at bone, but they found that they were more in the liver, the lung ones more in lung, and the brain ones more in brain. 
And um, they looked a lot at integrins and did the profiling of the integrins on the exosomes and how that related to the different organs that these exosomes were being taken up in. Um, and they validated for a specific integrin, um, alpha-6, beta-4, that that was important for exosomes going to the lung. So this is a nice example where they um, made exosomes that were purified from either um, integrin beta-4 knockdown cells or they took exosomes and used an uh, um, RJD inhibitory peptide or laminin receptor inhibitory peptide. And as alpha-6 beta-4 is a laminin receptor, they had uh, better success with the laminin inhibiting uh, a peptide than the RGD and the, the knockdown exosomes did not uh, get taken up in the lung uh, as, um, as much as the control exosomes. And I'm sorry, it, I hope that you can see this, but there, there should be more, more red here in the control situation. These were dye-labeled exosomes. In addition, the state of a cell that secretes the exosomes will likely determine the binding and the uptake. So basically, exosomes are uh, somewhat a, a snapshot of a cell. So they're a snapshot not only of the proteins uh, overall that a cell is making, but also the state of the cell because things are actively and specifically targeted to extracellular vesicles. Um, uh, the, the, the state, for example, um, stress or signaling state is going to affect um, the cargos. And there are a few examples that I've listed up here where, um, for example, B cell activation and signaling can affect the content of HLA on exosomes or uh, oxidative um, stress um, can affect uh, protein and RNA content um, uh, of exosomes. And, and so this is important because we, we of course, think that the, the cargo is what's going to affect the, the function um, in recipient cells, but it will also affect the addressability of these exosomes. Um, and, and target cell uptake. Okay, so how might you identify uh, EV cargo topology? This is um, uh, something that um, can be important for multiple reasons. One is just to try and understand um, where a protein or RNA is um, and, and also as a kind of control just to look at the purity of your preparations. Um, so um, mostly these are antibody based. Um, and uh, uh, actually the top one here, here's an example from um, one of uh, uh, my papers, but actually we adopted this method um, based on a paper from Sandra Brakefield's lab, um, uh, which was Lie et al. in Nature Communications, and it worked for us immediately, so we like it very much. And basically what you do in this is you just dot different amounts of uh, exosomes on a dot blot, and then you probe your dot blot with an antibody, just like you would a Western blot, um, but you do it either in the presence or absence of 0.1% uh, tween 20, which basically permeabilizes um, but doesn't destroy the exosomes, and it allows you to determine whether your cargo is on the inside or the outside of the exosomes. And so this is our positive control, which is uh, we use an antibody to an extracellular loop of CD63, and we detect that both in the absence and presence of detergent. Um, we've studied um, uh, the role of fibronectin on exosomes in promoting cell migration, and we find that indeed it is on the outside of exosomes, uh, just as it should be to promote adhesion formation, whereas the cytoplasmic tail of its receptor, integrin alpha-5, is only detectable under the detergent um, permeabilized conditions. Um, and we have actually used this to show that IGO2 is on the inside of exosomes in our preparations as well, which is important since um, uh, IGO2 can also be found in non-vesicular preparations carrying RNAs. And then, of course, another way to do this is, um, well, you could also uh, treat your vesicles with a proteinase to remove extracellular cargos and do a dot blot or western blot. We haven't actually tried this one, but um, uh, others have. And um, immuno-EM is another way to look at where the, the, the cargos are um, 
uh, with respect to um, the vesicles. Okay, so how about uptake? Um, so depending on what it is um, that the vesicle is doing, it may need to be taken up and fused with the cell. So if you're trying to deliver like an RNA, um, then uh, it has to fuse in some way. And um, this could happen on the plasma membrane, but, but most people have found that um, vesicles are most uh, efficiently taken up by endocytosis. So if you dye label an exosome or otherwise label it uh, with like a GFP CD63, you'll see that most of it gets taken up um, inside the cell via endosomes. And so, um, and, and they've been shown to be taken up via a variety of uh, endocytic pathways, so both clathrin-mediated phagocytosis, macropinocytosis, basically you name it, it can get into endosomes um, via virtually any pathway. Um, and then uh, would need to fuse um, uh, in order for those contents to um, uh, be accessible. Now we have very little idea of what the efficiency is of fusion once the vesicles are in the endocytic compartment. Um, so I think that this is something that um, a lot of people are interested in and working on, but um, uh, it's going to take some engineering of reporters and some, some careful, careful work um, to figure out what is the efficiency and how do we quantitate that. Okay, are there ways that you can inhibit uptake? Um, there are some ways. I'm not sure that I'm convinced that any of these are really great ways, um, but I'm mentioning some of them here. So um, you could inhibit binding. This doesn't really help you very much. So if you, you know, trypsinize the outside of your vesicles, they won't be able to bind to the cell um, and be taken up or fused. Um, uh, or you could use neutralizing antibodies. Um, you can inhibit endocytosis, and there are a couple of drugs that um, you could use to do this. One is called Dinosaur, which inhibits Dynamin. Um, another is called Pit Stop, which inhibits Clathrin. Um, and um, both of these have been used. However, they are described to have off-target effects as well. So one would have to keep that in mind if you were seriously interested in inhibiting um, endocytosis and looking at this, you, you probably uh, might need to validate it by like an uh, siRNA or shRNA um, of these molecules. Um, and uh, inhibiting fusion is also a, a little unclear. So it does appear, there, there are papers showing that um, fusion of exosomes anyway is enhanced by an acidic environment which kind of makes sense that they might fuse actually in the late endosome, which is an acidic environment. Um, so you could elevate pH, but again, this is going to perturb the membrane trafficking system a lot, so you're going to have a major backup of the system. Um, and like I said, uh, fusion of the plasma membrane, we don't really know how often this happens, and we also don't know how to inhibit that, so I think that's a big unknown. This is just to illustrate with a cartoon some of these pathways I talked about. So this is from a paper basically that talked about both uh, uh, um, how dinosaur, this drug, can um, affect, um, uh, I guess, endocytic pathways. So dynamin is involved in endocytosis and their um, dinosaur would um, uh, affect those. However, there are also um, been shown to be dynamic independent effects of dinosaur on the actin cytoskeleton um, that could also perturb membrane trafficking pathways. Um, and also dynamin is involved in pinching off of vesicles at other organelles like the trans-Golgi. So you would probably be affecting those processes as well. Oops, okay, so this I slide, I guess, was a little big for the um, uh, thing here, but you can see um, this is supposed to be um, systems to measure EV uptake and fusion. So um, a number of people have been trying to make tools to allow us to um, visualize um, things like um, 
EV transfer, EV uptake, EV fusion. This is an example from the Van Rienen Laboratory where they used a Cree lock system to um, identify um, recipient cells that had taken up extracellular vesicles from donor cells. And so the way this um, works is um, the donor cell is expressing a, a, a CFP fuse to um, Cree, and so this cell is blue. And um, uh, the Cree can be transferred via extracellular vesicles to a reporter cell, and the reporter cells have uh, LOX-P sites um, uh, surrounding uh, um, an RFP that's in front of a GFP. So basically the cell will switch from red to green when it has taken up um, uh, EVs, those EVs have fused, and either Cree protein or Cree RNA um, is, is transferred to the reporter cell. And, and they used this system to look both in in vitro co-cultures and also in vivo at the effects of transfer of um, donor EVs on the phenotype of recipient cells. Um, Xander Brakefield's lab has also been involved in making tools to do this. This is um, an example from uh, their Nature Communication uh, paper in, in 2015. Um, and, and they have a number of reporters, but this particular one I'm showing you is using a palmitylated a GFP to label the surface of vesicles green so that you can see the vesicles being transferred. And then uh, having a, um, a luciferase reporter that is packaged into the extracellular vesicles so that you can see when the luciferase is, is transferred to a recipient cell, um, the bioluminescence. And so this is useful particularly for in vivo work um, where you, you can um, use luciferase. And so what they did is they looked without cyclohexamide or with cyclohexamide at the impact of um, the luciferase expression because it was being transferred as an RNA. So you can see there's um, no effect of cyclohexamide on the palm GFP because it's labeling the vesicles that gets uh, transferred all the same. Um, without cyclohexamide, there's more luciferase that's um, being transferred, but even with cyclohexamide, there's some uh, translation of the RNA that's, that's happening so that the luciferase um, uh, it continues uh, to be expressed off that um, RNA in recipient cells. Okay, so yeah, just to summarize, it's time to wrap up. Um, there are multiple biogenesis pathways. This is obviously still an active area of research in the field. This leads to different sorting mechanisms. Although the escort pathway is the most characterized for exosomes, there are still some confusing points. Um, for example, I didn't really talk about this, but there are some redundant components, and also there's some cross-talk um, with uh, other mechanisms. And I would say, this is my opinion, that the sorting of cytosolic proteins and RNAs is the least understood of how they actually connect with the membrane machinery and get into the vesicles. And for binding and uptake, um, binding seems to determine the addressability and uptake of EVs, so this is important for therapeutic applications if you're trying to target these EVs to a specific recipient cell. I think uptake at this point is hard to inhibit cleanly, but it does look like most of the uptake happens through endocytosis, so that's, excuse me, a place to start. And um, uh, some fluorescence and luciferase-based systems exist for tracking EV transfer and fusion, and I think more are likely to be on the way. So this is my laboratory, and um, hopefully some of you will go next week to ISEV. This is a big society for extracellular vesicles, and for those of you that are not going to the meeting next week, they also have um, massive online courses that are educational for extracellular vesicles that are really good. So if you want to learn more, that's another place to go. Thank you. We have, we have time maybe for one question, just for the sake of time. So um, give, given um, what you showed about the biogenesis of, the, of these vesicles, has anyone tried to block lysosomal biogenesis as a means of increasing the output from uh, um, exosomes? 
So it's the, the competing pathways. So there are competing pathways. And that's a good question. I, I would expect that it would increase, but I, I also think it would have really detrimental effects on cells to block lysosomal biogenesis. Um, but I, I don't know of any studies where anyone has tried to do that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for.